So welcome uh, for this week, uh, Python training. So um, if you have cloned the Git repository I sent you and opened Jupyter Notebook, you should have something that looks like that on your web browser. Uh, if you have just taken the two files I've sent, you should have just the basic Python and test.txt, which is fine. Okay, so today we're going to look at the week two notebook. Okay. So we start with the functions. So how to uh, write a function in Python and, um, yeah, and how to use functions. So uh, this is a you know basic function you start by def um, um, python doesn't do any difference between functions or routine whatever it's all function so it's all def the name of your function uh, parentheses for the arguments arguments are separated by comma and as always a colon at the end um, to start and your function body is uh, indented uh, one and here I tell you that if you want to put some information about your function, uh, this is a nice way to do it. Uh, and it's kind of the standard way to do it like this with three um, apostrophes uh, at the start and at the end. And you see that uh, you don't need anything to um, continue the line. Python just does it for you. Um, and at the end of your function, you have a return uh, statement. Uh, it can return something or return nothing. Uh, it depends what your function does. Um, and it can return several things. Um, usually when you return several things, you put them in a tuple. But, uh, but it doesn't have to. Um, just... Okay. So as you see, that's a pretty uh, stupid function because you're just adding two things together. And it doesn't even check that you can add two, these two things together. So, um, but yeah. And the way to call the function is simply the name of the function with your arguments in between parentheses. And so if I run this, um, oh, sorry, I forgot to run the cell to define the function. And I run this. Um, it's telling me it's going to add one and two together, and it gets three. So you see the one here gets into arg1 and the two here gets into arg2, so it's in the same order. No, no surprise here. Okay, so now what are the different type of arguments you can have for the function? Um, you can have required and optional arguments. You can have, you can give argument by position, like what we did before. You see one went to, it's in position one, so it's r one and uh, or you can um, give arguments by name, which is also uh, called keyword argument. So if you want to give arguments per name, you actually don't have to do anything special when you define your function. Um, here I can use my function and give the name of the argument. So arg2 equal 1 and arg1 equal 2, and I can put them in whatever order I want because I give the names. And uh, Python understands that. Um, what is illegal uh, when mix, you can mix positional arguments and uh, named arguments, but what is illegal is to put name argument before positional arguments, so positional arguments should go first. And when you use positional arguments first, uh, this one will go to arg1. So if after you have arg1 equals something, Python will tell you, oh, I already have an arg1 argument, you can't give me another one. Uh, that's not allowed. Uh, so here you could only have one number and arg2 equals something uh, if you wanted to. Um, and so this, um, to show you, um, it still gives me three, but it tells you it's at two and one. So arg1 is equal at two and arg2 equal one, uh, despite me uh, specifying them in the other um, order. For optional arguments, 
Um, typically, for, you define your function, you put your argument, and for some of the arguments, you can put equal something. So for optional, you can put equal none. And then you can have if case that uh, if is not none, so you given the argument, you use it for your written uh, statement, and you can see in the written statement you can have uh, calculations there. And else you give it without the, using the opt argument. Um, and you can see that in this case, I can call my function with only one argument, and it will work. It will give me one. It just written arg one. And if I give it two arguments, it gives me the multiplication of the two, so it's four. So now the, there's a question, and the question is, what is going on with this one? Why do I get one when I give one and zero? We would expect that one times zero equals zero. So um, I let you think about it and tell me what's going on if you Anyone with an ID? Yeah. No? Do you want more time or do you want? Um, okay. I will let you. Do you want more time or not? To think about it. Anyone? <laughs> No, okay, you don't want more time, we say. Okay, here is the if, the if statement. I said if opt, I do something, and else I do something else. So the thing is that for Python, Python considers three things to be false, none, false, and zero. So because I give opt equals zero, zero is considered false, so my if is if false, so it goes to S and just does that. So this part me giving, so, and you see if you go up here, it was really if op is not none. So you have to be careful when you do your uh, if statement with optional argument that you really just say, you know, it's the case that it's not whatever you give here, otherwise uh, it won't necessarily act as you want. And uh, for info, these are uh, total uh, collapsible things. So if you click here, uh, it will give you the answer. Um, so you can refer to it later on uh, when you when you want. So typically, uh, be careful with that to do your if statement correctly. Um, okay, and. Here, you don't have to um, always say equal none, so you can use this as a default value for your optional arguments, which are not necessarily um, none. So in this case, I say uh, optical five, so if I don't give the opt argument, it will be equal to five, and if I give it a value, it will not be equal to five. So you can see if I run the cell with uh, giving only one, it will be five plus one equals six, and if I give one and six, it gives me one plus six equals seven. So, opt as um, the value amount. Okay, and uh, to come back to something we saw a bit last week, it was a st um, star and double star operator you can give your argument through tuple, list, or dictionaries. So if I have a tuple of one and four, and I do this call like that with a star t, it will use these two values as my two arguments for my function, and we'll do four plus one. Um, I can also have them in the dictionary and have two uh, stars, and this will unpack as arg1 equal 1 and opt equal 4. So you need to have uh, your dictionary 
names here to be the same as the argument names in your uh, function definition. And you can see that in each case, it gives me five, so four plus one. And here I tell you why do I tell you that? Um, it can be useful, especially for plotting, um, to have a dictionary with your uh, plot um, options, because if you want to do several plots that use the same options, uh, then you can reuse your options pretty easily uh, from one plot to the next, or just change one option pretty easily. And it can help with the readability of your um, code as well. Okay, is everything all right with the functions so far? Well, what's the dictionary? What is the dictionary? Yeah. Um, so we saw that last week. I will open the notebook again. Oh no, it's there. So a dictionary, it allows you to um, keep in one object uh, several values and each value has a label or a name. So for example, here, dic is a dictionary and I could do dic1 uh, and it tells me it's one this means a value, so it, I can refer to the value by a name rather than um, a position or, um, you know, or having separate um, having separate objects that I need to remember they are all connected. This way, I can keep all together when I, what I want. Okay. Does that Thank answer you. your question? Thank you. Yeah. Um, the other thing to think about when you're looking at function is a uh, global versus local scope of your variables. So variables defined in a function are local, so that means they are unknown outside the function. Um, but you can use, but variables defined outside the function are global, which means they are known inside the function. Um, so here it's a bit of an exercise to understand better the global and local um, scope. So here you see I define a total equals zero uh, variable that is global, it's outside any function, and then I, de I define a first function that's called summing. I run the function and then I print, um, I print total after the function. And then the second example where I redefine total, I have another function and then um, I print the result of that function. And um, the question is, do you understand what is going on in here? Uh, so when I print total after the function, I get zero. Um, but the function defines a total. Do you understand why total is still zero after the function? Did it find it? So typically in this case, um, when you define your function, your variable inside your function, this total variable is only known inside my function. It is not the same as this one. They have the same name, but they are not the same. They are not pointing to the same place in memory. They, for, for Python, they are different uh, variables. Okay. So after the function, I cannot access the value of this. Actually, I can because it's written by the function, but uh, to, to access the value of this after this function, I need to what to get the value of that. If I if I if I get the value of total, I get the value of this variable total, which is in global scope and not local to my uh, function. So be careful and uh, in general, especially when starting, try to give different names to visual variables because then it avoids all confusion like that, uh, which is good. 
And in the second example, you see that my sum2 function has a total, which is not defined at all within my function, and it still works. And it tells me that 3 plus 4 equals 9, uh, simply because it does 3 plus 4 plus total, which is equal to 2. So it does 3 plus 4 plus 2. And so again, be careful of that. Um, if you have something defined in outside of any function, and then you use this in a function without redefining it, it will still find the values that was defined before, and you can get uh, wrong outputs from your functions if it's not what you're expecting. Um, so, yeah, so sum2 here knows a total function, a total variable. Um, and that's not necessarily what you would want to do when writing the function. Um, again, I would say when starting, try not to use that, that sort of things, and always define your, like, give total as an argument of your function or define it inside or do something, but um, don't use it like that. Um, okay, so Python passes arguments per reference. Um, that means that arguments inside a function are still pointing to the same memory than as the variables that exist outside the function. Um, and that means that you can change your uh, variables without wanting it, if you're not careful. So here you see I have a new functions um, that has an argument li, and li um, is expected to be a list. It doesn't say so here, but it's expected to be a list. And here I'd say, oh, I want to change a first element of my function, of my list, and I don't return anything, you know, I don't return anything. And here I have my list, and I say list equal now this list. And the question is, what happens when you run these two functions? You can see that my list at the start is one, two. When I run change me with my list, I become three, two. So it has been changed. Um, it's still the same variable, it has been changed. Uh, it's something you might want or you might not want. So you have to be careful when changing only one element. Um, the best way of doing it normally is to define a local variable that is equal to the old one and then return this variable. Um, and then um, after change me too, you can see that uh, actually it, your list hasn't changed. Uh, what happened here is that because you completely redefine your variable, uh, it's, it li here become a local variable that is not known outside of the uh, function, and so you lose the li variables that was the argument of your function. Um, and then what happened in the function here has no impact whatsoever with the outside world because it doesn't return anything. Um, so if you want to redefine completely your argument, this is not a good way to do it. You have to do it element by element or, or doing something like, like that. I want to change all my elements. So it's something you will you will find out when writing your own functions, and you will be like, what is going on? Um, it, I just put it there because I, then you have a reference for it when you can come back and I'll check what's going on. Okay, that's it about functions. Do you have any questions? No? Good. Um, okay, I so far, for, uh, Claire, I have a question. Yeah. I see your will define uh, define a function. 
in the return statement, sometimes you return the value of the function, sometimes you just, just return. Mm -hmm. Is it the, you have to put the, uh, you know, in the function, we define function like this one, define change in me, and you have a return. You don't have to return LI. Yeah, so it depends what you want. So I will go back to other functions, for example. So here, for example, in summing, you see I define a new variable that is total. If I want to access this variable outside the function, I need to return it. Okay, understand. Okay, and, and then when I call the function here, add will get the value that is written uh, within total. If I don't, if I just change the directly the arguments like here, I don't necessarily need to return the values because they, they will be changed in place. Uh, so you see my here after change me, I have changed my list without returning anything. So it really you need to give something to return if you want to return something that has been calculated in a new variable in your function. Yes. If you're simply Okay, if we in this in that last example, uh, define change me to, if you return li, and then you print li, it won't be three two, it will be five four, right? Exactly, exactly. Okay. So in this case, it doesn't. In this case, this function doesn't do anything. <laughs> so in this just case, we, time. actually, we don't need to use the function. We can just use a like normal. Yes, yes. Yeah. These are pretty. Stupid functions. <laughs> I wouldn't find them as functions, but as I, I kept them simple to really just have what yeah. was to be there. Um, yeah, yeah. So in this case, change me too doesn't do anything except spending some time. I can. Uh, yeah. So if you wanted to have the li values, you would have to do return uh, li, and then you would change your um, list li. Actually, you wouldn't. Um, oh, we can we can try this one. Okay. So I've added written li, and um, you see that my li here didn't change. It is three, just three two. And why is that? Is because I haven't stored the value returned by change me to. Um, I would have to say li equal change me to, so that um, it would go in my global variable. Li and not just uh, the local variable. That's again an example of the global versus local scope. Uh, if you have things that are called the same, you very quickly become uh, confused by what's going on. Um, I've done it on purpose here, obviously. So if I do it like that, you see, in this case, I have changed Li to 5.4. Okay, any other questions about functions? No? Okay. So we'll look at working with files, uh, text files in this case, uh, not NetEDF or with uh, files. Okay, so to open a text file, there's an open function. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, it has two arguments, the name of the file and the opening map mode for the file. So you can open in read-only, write-only, open to existing file, read and write mode. So nothing strange here. Um, one more thing, open doesn't just open text file, it also can open binary files. You simply have to put a B uh, to the mode, so if you put RB, you want to read a binary file. If you want to write a binary file, you put WB and RB plus. Um, yeah, so it's just B for binary. Okay, to read the file now, it might seem a bit more complicated because there are three methods, uh, read, read line, and read lines. Um, 
and the only difference is the amount of data they read from the farm. Uh, read will only read the given number of characters or the whole farm. Read line read the file line by line and read lines read in the entire file uh, or maximum number of characters. Um, yeah. And just one more thing, uh, Python can manage uh, you know, the end of line marker between Windows and Unix are different and sometimes you would have to convert your Windows file to Unix with those to Unix and stuff like that. Uh, Python doesn't have the problem. So um, if you have a Windows file, it should be able to open it on a Unix machine and not get um, frustrated about it. And finally, to close a file, you use the close method, uh, which again, pretty straightforward. So um, as I've sent you a test file, uh, we can open it if you want to have a look what's in there. Uh, you see, it's just two lines of text and some numbers. Uh, I think, um, to kind of to uh, see what happens with the CSV type file. Um, so I open it like that the name of the file, I say I want to read from it, and I put this in a variable, which is my um, my file object. Uh, if I want to read the whole file, I can do f.read, so that means I want to read everything that is in f. Um, here, I've, because I've put all of them together, I have to put the seek method with allows you to go anywhere in the file you want. So six zero will uh, rewind to the top of the file. So I read all the file, I'm at the bottom, I do six zero, I go back to the top and I can read again and do like that. Uh, if I just want to read one line, I can do read line. And um, again, to read all files, we can also use read lines. And at the end I can close and um, And so if I do that, uh, you can after, oh, when does it? If you want, you can see the difference between um, read and read lines. So if I, if I print whole file, so whole file is the result of f.read. And it gives me that. So you see, it's, it's um, I can give you the type of it too. And see the type, it's it's a string. It writes the whole file into one string. Um, if I go to whole two, which is read with read lines, It's a list, and and if I just write whole two, you will see that the list, and it's a list where each element is one line of the file, and the backslash n means it's the end of line marker, uh, which is still there in the line. So uh, yeah, f dot read will just give you one string with everything. Read dot read lines gives you uh, a list of all the lines if you're in your file. So depending on what you want, uh, you can use one or the other. Um, or oh, one more thing. If I go back to print whole file. Uh, you see when I print it, it uh, prints in several lines. That means that the end of line marker is still there in, the, in my string. Um, so um, if you, you have to be careful of that, there's still the end of, of line uh, characters in your string. But here, I'm confused here. You print brackets, whole, Space file, 
but that variable is not defined. You only yes. define a whole underscore file, not a whole. Oh, it's, there, file. there is an underscore. It's just this. This is in the web, but uh, let me go down. There's an underscore. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. And we can print first line, but it's just the first line of the of the file. Oh, that's not. Okay, so to write to file, it's pretty similar. You open the file in W mode, and you have a write um, uh, method. So you can just do f dot write hello, and you have a write lines method where you can define your lines in a list. And you can see what happens here if I do this, and then I go to open the, my file that was written. It happens that it has written everything together instead of writing line by line. Uh, so why did this happen? Why why all of these is written is one line and not separate lines? I know it's written on the on the thing. Um, <coughs> It's written in one line because each of my strings, you see here, I haven't said I wanted to, uh, I haven't put the new line symbol, so I would have need to put this at the end of each string to define this string is one line and this string is one line. So even if I give different strings in a list, it will not, what lines will not understand them as different lines. It only, um, you know, it needs the um, backslash n to understand the end of a line, um, which is what I've put here. And in this case, if I do that and reopen the my file that txt, um, I've got lines now. So it's something to remember, even if this is written, write lines, it will only write different lines if you tell it to do so. Okay. Okay, so something that you might see quite often in Python, if you read some Python written by other people, is the with statement. Um, you can do something like that. You can say with this file open in reading mode, as f, so um, this this is the same. This typically is the same as f equal open uh, and the two thing. So that's the same f here and there. Um, so with this file open, I want to read the first line, uh, typically. And why would you do it this way rather than the other way? Um, it has better error handling and uh, it's closing the file for you, so you have less. You are less likely to forget to close your file, which can be useful. Um, and to show you that it closes the file for you, you see here I've read one line. It's in, within the with statement, and I'm out of the with statement. I print, I print my first line and then I try to read the second line and see what happens. It tells me our operation on closed file because I'm out of my with statement, the file has been closed. Um, so I can't read it. Um, um, this can be useful uh, to make sure you know when the file is open and when it's not open. Okay, so one exercise. Um, I told you the test.txt file, I sent it to you. It's like a CSV file. Uh, <laughs> this exercise is to try to read these uh, data and put them in a list. Um, and you can format your list, whichever one, where you want. 
Uh, just one hint, this is a real pain to do a uh, stretch like that, so probably don't try. Uh, but these two are relatively simple. And I said hint, check the Python built-in functions. Uh, because we want a list of numbers, not a list of strings. So you will want to uh, convert your string in numbers. And um, that's a built-in function. So Python has a nice page where you have all the built-in functions. Um, can anyone spot which built-in function might be interesting of interest in this case? I know you just have the names, but is there any names that sounds promising? Anyone want to want to venture, I guess, or? So you have the functions float, int, x if you want, but um, I don't think you want to work in hexadecimal. Um, so float will convert to float, int will convert to int, str will convert to string. Um, it's a bit like tuple, list, and dict were converting to tuple, list, and dictionaries. I guess and CHR will convert to characters and bytes to go to bytes. Um, so all these functions are there and they're just the name of whatever you want to be. Um, okay, so do you want to give it a try and try to um, create to read the file and create this list? Or do you want to do it together or whatever? Do you want to try to do it together? So yes. the exercise is to no is to read a file. So what do we need to do first to read a file? What do we, what do we first need to do before for reading the file? Open it. Open it. So we'll use the with statement because that's probably the form you're less um, confident with. So the file is called test.txt. What mod do we want? Sorry, I, I hear some mumbling, but not loud enough to know what's going on. <laughs> Do we want to write, to read, to append, to what do you want to do with the file? Write. Yeah. We want to read it. Uh, write. We have to read. Yeah. Read. Yeah. Read. Yeah. read. We want to read the file. We want to. We want to read the values in the file. So test the text exists, and we want to read these values okay. <laughs> to use them in our program or whatever. That's it. So we want um, to read the file. And we call it F because we are very original. So you see here I've just pressed enter after the colon and uh, the notebook automatically uh, realizes I want to open a statement. So it tabulates for me, which is nice. So now that the file is open, what do we want to do?
open a file you want to read, right? Yes, we want to read. So what do we want to read? Do we want to read the whole file at once or do we want to read a bit more differently? Like, are we interested in the whole file or not? Well, like no. we're only interested in these two lines, right? I'm only interested in the numbers, yes. So we need to discuss this. Yes. Right. So the best way to discuss this is actually to oh. to do, for example, to do a loop of two, because we have two lines we want to discard. And we read the two lines one by one. For example, we can do the loop like that. Or we can actually we so here you see it will I'll do twice, it will, it will do twice with a line. So it will read, read your two lines and you don't put them in any variables or whatever, so it kind of vanish. You don't keep it in memory. It just allows you to go from the start of the file to here. And suddenly Python knows your file marker kind of thing is here. What I would what I would I do? I want to read the last two rows of numbers, and every number as one what array. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So once you once you're here, so you exit yeah. the for loop. I went back one in there. So in this, now you want to keep your lines in a variable, so you can put a variable name, whatever you want. Okay. So I've read one of the lines. Actually, we can just use the read lines um, if we want. That will read the two, all the, all the extra lines, which is fine, and put them in each line in a list. So. If I do this and I do, okay, let's do that for the moment. Okay, so far we're here. We end up with a variable TT, which is a list of two elements. Each element is a string and each, the, each string is one line of our files that we want to keep. That's good so far. I don't want to read as a string. I want to read as a number, numerical number. You, what do I do? You can't read as a number. You read as a string and then you convert to number. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So now what you want to do is uh, split those strings into um, independent strings here. Sorry. 50, 30, 40, and then I'll convert each of those to uh, numbers, uh, right? So if I go back here, if I put my print T here to show you, okay, so TT is always is from the start the list of two elements. So I can say, I can do a, a loop on the TT elements. I will call them, okay. So I remember and remind you that as a for loop, uh, you don't need to have ne necessarily a range of number. You can just loop directly on a list. So TI each becomes each element of the list one, one after the other. Okay, and so for splitting a string, we did it last time. Um, if you remember, and I can say um, uh, equal um, ti dot split, um, and I can say I want to split according to the comma, and then oops.
and then it will give me this. So you see, we got all, in, all the, we loop through all the elements of TT, the two elements, and each of them we split them with the comma. So each time LL become a three element list, which is 50, 30, and 40. And, and after it becomes 70, 20, 30. Uh, for the moment, we haven't saved the list between each iteration of the loop, but we'll do it that after. Okay. Um, so now we need to save all of these together in one list. Um, so what we can do is before the loop, we can create our result, result equal um, a list with an empty list for the start. Okay. And then we can use the, for example, the append function, which append to a list and some new elements. And what do we want to happen? We don't really want to happen LL directly because LL is a list of strings. We want a list of numbers. Um, so one way to do that in uh, Python is in this way to do it. Um, uh, we can take um, a the L element, okay, we can put in a list something, a loop in a list. So we can say, we can loop over all the elements in LL, and on each of these elements, I want to transform them in integers. And I want to put all of these elements back into a list. Does that make sense or not? Or is it going too fast? That makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So if I print res now, I'm within the loop, so it will be. So you see, you get um, res first is a list with one element, which is a three element list, and then it becomes a second element. And then you get the second element. And so at the end of everything, you can still print res, and you get this list line there. So that's one way to format it, and you get what you want. You know, you get a list, and each element of your list is one of the lines of your file. And each of those lines have um, integers. OK. The question is, so that was this format. Um, how would we get this format? Um, we kind of discussed it at the end last week. Um, I will call it rest to, to uh, go with the format. Um, last week we discussed that our list also have a function that's called extend. And so if I do exactly the same thing but um, put it in extend instead of append, I get the other format. So that um, extend, so append you see it says, oh, I want this list as one more element of my previous list. I extend will take, will uh, unpack the list and put each of the elements as one element in my uh, previous list. Okay. Read this mixture of uh, string and numbers in a file. So it's very complex. It seems very complex to do that for reading yeah. the file. Yeah, you yes. can code to read the numbers out of the file. I know, and there is a much 
easier way to do so, and we're going to see it after. But for the moment, it's, it's also just to um, get you to think about writing Python and how to do it uh, in the hard way. <laughs> Um, okay, so for the third format here, um, that's really a pain to get like that, so we're not going to write it. We're going to look at the answer because otherwise it's, um, it's a lot. So you again define a list at the, at, the, at the start, and then you have to have if, depending if you're the first time through or afterwards. Um, so the first time you define, uh, this will define you a list. Okay, we will, this will define you a list that has, uh, so that's a list, and the first element is a list with 50, and then a second element that's a list with 30, and a third element that's a list with 40. So you get your three uh, elements there, which are lists. And then on the second time around, uh, it will happen to each of those uh, uh, sub-elements of your list, uh, an additional uh, thing. Anyway, I can let you go through it if you want. That's really, as I said, there's a much easier way to read this file than doing through that. Um, this is mainly for you to um, go through and see if you understand what's going on and to present this form of um, creating a list with a for loop inside the, the list creation. Okay, any more questions on this? Uh, but I'm um, inking for um, by default, the, the default read in, uh, like read line and read in Python will only read strings. Uh, so if you use that, that's only strings. And you have to use something else uh, that is not in the default Python to read a CSV file. Much more straightforward. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, additional functionality. So, Python by default, when you just install Python, um, it has quite a lot of functionalities, but not that many. And when you start a Python interpreter, you actually load only a subset of these default functionalities. Uh, this is so that the start is quick and uh, you is to reduce your memory usage, because if you load everything that's there, it will already take a lot of memory. Uh, and additionally, Python is open source, uh, so that means a lot of additional functionalities have been developed by other developers all over the world. So you can, um, there are a lot of packages that you can add to your own Python uh, thing. Um, and you have to install these packages before installing, before using them. So. One thing we do at CMS for for people is we are managing some content environments with quite a lot of packages in them. Uh, they are publicly available, so Yingping, feel free to use them if you're using Imagine or, or NCI in any way. Uh, to use them, you have to uh, use this module uh, comments. Uh, they are, uh, so the content environments are under G data HH5. So you have to say you want to use that and then you load Conda. There are several environments. I would say uh, the one that is loaded by default is probably the one you want to use um, at the start. And if you really find something that's not there, or you, know, you can see other things. Um, and I want to say these environments already have a lot of packages, but not necessarily everything. If you find a package that seems 
will be useful for you, uh, don't hesitate to send us an email because uh, we're happy to add packages as long as they play nicely with other packages and don't create too much of a headache. Uh, but anyway, just send us an email and we'll see if we can add it or not um, and let you know. Um, but yeah, if you're going to use Python on NCI, which is anywhere on NCI, so it's Rajin, Access Dev, and VDI, uh, please don't hesitate to use those environments. Don't install your own things. So now that you have lots of stuff installed for Python, um, how do you use them in your script so you have the import statement? Uh, the most basic form of the of the import statement, sorry, is import space and the name of your package. Uh, a common one that is used is import the name of your package and ask to give an alias to your package. So np is common for NumPy, uh, for example. Uh, why do you give an alias? Because it saves on typing afterwards within your script. So um, a short alias can be useful. You can also import just a part of a package. Uh, for this, you have two ways of doing that. You can say, from this package, I want to import only this thing, and I want to call it this in my script. Or you can uh, import from the package dot uh, the functionality you want. Uh, here, in fact, so matplotlib is a package for plotting, and uh, NumPy is a package for arrays. So uh, matplotlib.pyplot, pyplot actually is not just one function, it has a lot of other functions in it, that's why. I usually it's enough to import that, but... Yeah. Okay, and so once you have uh, imported your packages, like that, uh, you can use a package. Um, so when you want to use a function of this package, that's not anymore a built-in function from Python. So you have to put the name of the package dot the name of your function. Uh, so that's why it's kind of nice to give a short um, alias to your package, because then you can only write np instead of numpy every time. Um, yeah. And uh, a range is a function that gives you, uh, we'll, we'll run it, that will uh, be easier. It gives you an array that goes from 0 to 19, you know, 20. It's like a range, but for creating an array instead of, a, of an iterator or a list. So, yeah. Um, any questions on importing packages? Or? Uh, I just want to say one thing, uh, the fact that all these packages are developed by a lot of different people means that documentation can be a bit uh, difficult. Uh, some people are very good at documentation, some are very poor at documentation. Uh, and uh, so that's why often um, a question on Google or Stack Overflow can be more useful than the document documentation of the package itself. Um, it really depends on the package. Uh, Matplotlib for plotting has a big uh, um, library of examples and galleries, so you can find a plot that looks like what you want, and then it gives you the script that uh, produces it. And, uh, some explanations too, so it's useful. So yeah, well, it depends. Um, so I was, we also wanted to give you a few useful packages that you might want. Um, as I said, from um, with the basic Python, when you open it to your interpreter, you don't have everything that uh, is in Python. Uh, all of these. Um, functionalities are within the basic Python. You don't need to install anything additional, but you need to import them if you want to use them. And if you look at what they do, um, one thing I didn't say at the start is Python is a full 
uh, programming language, and typically you can use Python to replace uh, shell language, for, exa for example. Especially if you don't know any shell language yet, don't go and learn a shell, shell language in too much details, but instead just learn Python and do things in Python. Um, it will do a lot more for you than just learning shell. So, because you, see, you can do things with uh, operating system, um, pass name manipulations, file operations. Um, you can use um, pattern expansions, so you know, like the star for files or everything that has, that has a zero nine in it, kind of thing. Uh, you can also, once you're a bit more um, confident with Python, um, give uh, op common lot of options to your uh, scripts, so you don't have to go and change within the script. You can directly uh, give command learn option, and outpass allows you to do that quite easily, actually. And finally, the sub-process, uh, probably not at the start of using Python, but if you want to run um, a separate program from within Python, so you can start your script, run something, and get the output and continue your Python script. Um, and now all additional packages, um, there are a lot more than that that could be useful, but most of them would be specific to what you're doing. Those are more likely to be uh, useful for all of you. So as I said, NumPy is the package for arrays in Python. Don't go and that's um, pretty much the standard now. Um, SciPy is developed SciPy and NumPy are developed by the same people, so it's all compatible, and SciPy allows you to have more math functions to use on your uh, arrays. Um, after you have Pandas, uh, I've said it's the ultimate to work with time series. Uh, so Pandas is built on, upon NumPy, but has functionalities that are especially good for its time series. Um, and then uh, you have X-Array, that's my own level to say better arrays in Python. Um, the official documentation that only says that's labeled arrays in whatever dimension. Um, we won't see today why it is a better array uh, package. We'll see that next week when looking at NetCDF. Um, but uh, again, X-Array is built upon Pandas and NumPy. So um, today we'll start to have a look at NumPy, which is, um, as you see, the base for everything else. So that's why uh, it can't be avoided. And then these two are for plotting. And there are a lot of plotting packages around, but uh, those are, I guess, very generic. Um, some are, tends to be a lot more specific in um, the way they plot. I don't know if there are any NCL users around. Uh, for NCL users, there is a package that is called PyNGL or Pingle that um, typically mimics the NCL way of doing uh, graphics. It is not installed currently in the Conda environment we have, but um, if you would like to use it, we could have a look. And finally, I've put Dask for parallelization. Uh, obviously, you starting with Python, you're not going to look at parallelization from the start. Uh, and the thing is that Dask works with X-Array, with arrays quite uh, seamlessly, so that's why I put it there in case you encounter it. So as you see, it's relatively um, generic topics of, of um, packages. Uh, if you have, uh, if you wonder if there's something that exists that would be more specific for you, you can feel free to ask around and, uh, or to look around them. Probably is. Okay, so finally, let's look at arrays. Am I? Oh, I'm way over time. Sorry. 
Um, so I guess we're going to stop here um, and do that later. Sorry about that. Do you have any questions? No? Oh, yes. No. Yeah, I just wanted to ask the list of um, packages you were just talking about. Are they available for both Windows and Unix? Yes. Because I'm sure I was trying to install something and it said that it wasn't the right environment, but I was using a Windows um, laptop and I wondered if that was the issue. It was a, it's a Wolf Python. I'm pretty sure some packages are not available on Windows, but I would say those are most likely yeah. okay. um, a... So we, we don't use Windows and, and CMS team, so we have very little uh, experience with doing it in Windows. But uh, if you send us your... If you send us your problem, maybe we can tell you what was happening, or maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> but... <laughs> Yeah. We we can we could at least have a look and see uh, if we can. Okay. Claire, we needed the yeah. module though. Just is it, is it the is it Python or Conda? No, the mod, how to using the Conda thing. Oh. Yeah. So that's just um, Scott. Is that right? Module load Conda is just going to. Is that going to load analysis or just the Python 3? That's going to load analysis 3. Cool. Just want to yeah. I have a question. Um, I'm a big fan of Spider. So Spider helps me. I'm a former MATLAB user. And I think this is beneficial for a lot of new students who try to switch from MATLAB to Python to have this package Spider. And it's not in the list. Okay, so what's... But I, I would love to use it. Okay. Because there you have on the left side your script and on the right side your Python console. So you have everything on one screen. It has a lot of functionality which helps new users, I think. Yeah, so um, ID won't be installed on Rajin, that's for sure. You would have to install it on your own machine. Okay. In your own environment. Um, we can't. Um, I'll do that. Great. We want to install ID uh, by default on on Raji. I suppose it means you can just download it to your own directory and just run it from your own directory. So things like PyCharm, I know you just download yourself and run it. Um, you should see the environment's fine. Okay, are we finished? Yeah, okay, so um, we'll see you in two weeks.